Hey there, Pinpoint Players. It's Tim here with the Pinpoint Players Podcast. Joined tonight with my buddy, Ramsey. What's up, guys? Wanted to give you guys a special bonus episode for those who've joined uh, and listened to the content so far. I want to thank you, listeners, for tuning in. We produced this Blood, Sweat, and Tears over the years through Thick and Thin, my buddy Ramsey and I. So I want to thank you guys for tuning in and listening. Yeah, guys, this is a special episode. Um, we decided kind of last second impromptu, like, let's make a bonus episode for those right before Christmas for everybody that's either at home with their families or maybe just sitting on their couch and want somebody to occupy their time. So glad you listened to us. Absolutely. We hope you do continue to listen. We've got some wonderful content produced. As the end of the year is coming to an end, there has been something that has been on my mind that I wanted to have a serious discussion with. And with this being the proper channel to do it, I wanted to talk to Pinpoint Players about Pokemon. Yep, it's something that Tim and I have been collecting ever since we were about, what would you say, eight, seven, eight, nine years old. Yeah. Something that's been stuck with us since the 90s. And the long story short of it is, Tim and I have been collecting the trading cards since we were kids. I mean, we took big breaks, obviously, during the 2000s and everything. Most of the stuff I have, anyways, from the 90s. And due to the recent developments, the value of these cards have shot up through the roof. And today's episode, we're going to talk about just that, our experiences, and then other things that we've kind of learned through our searches on the internet about this experience. Absolutely. I mean, I think we've all dabbled a little bit in Pokemon card trading or collecting at a certain point in our uh, in our youth. I mean, Pokemon cards were a very large staple of the Pokemon franchise, uh, mostly pushed by uh, a very successful media uh, video game team. There has been a really interesting surge in Pokemon card prices this year. Year of all years. But to some of us, this day has uh, been coming for quite some time. This is the day that we were all waiting for since we were maybe nine years old. It's kind of like the Beanie Baby situation, but actually this time it's paid off. It's worth quite a bit. And for me, my personal antidote, it's one of those things where I had the cards, I kept it safe in a binder all these years, and over time, just kind of sat around for a while, just safe and sound in one of my bins in my drawers. All of a sudden, this year has just been an explosion of its value, so... For me, just being someone that's on the periphery, Tim, like this has been kind of out of nowhere. So would you be able to kind of give context? I actually would. I kind of foresaw this, and it was kind of by accident, too. Um, I had landed a very stable job in the, in the field in Boston, in the Boston area that was very uh, successful for a lighting electrician, a lighting designer, uh, sort of hand in hand. But um, I was able to look at the things that, I really you know, cherished as a kid, and I had an opportunity to get back into that niche of collecting. And, and uh, I have uh, some very interesting purchases that I made early 2019, late 2018, that uh, any serious collector would actually be interested to hear the prices for the cards that I, uh, that I paid for. The first one that I have is a first edition Raichu card, base set. Uh, I bought, I, pur I purchased it for roughly eighty dollars in March of 2019. That card sold earlier this week for four to five hundred dollars. Uh, the value has been going up because it has been sort of incorporated into a few different multimedias. There have been certain YouTubers who have been making a living doing Pokemon card box openings. There have been certainly multiple media pushes by the Pokemon card or not the Pokemon card, but the Pokemon company itself to expand its uh, franchise globally, which is done successfully. As of March 2017, its domestic revenue uh, declaration has been upwards of $70 billion, which makes it the most profitable multimedia franchise in history, surpassing Star Wars and the Marvel uni u the Cinematic Universe, which... It's a substantial feat in its own. So there's some big money behind this. There certainly is. And with every generation being introduced to Pokemon from a generation that it itself had grown up in, it's being adopted in our culture in a way that a few economists, I think, are actually kind of worried about the trajectory happening. So there's a couple of loose terms that I picked up in a couple of different videos that can, you, uh, the pinpoint players, can also watch and judge for yourselves 
which I highly encourage you do. Um, the first video is called, where is it? Oh, I think, I think I know the one you're talking about. Um, oh yeah. It's economic. So it's a YouTube channel called economics explain. It's a really good channel guys. I recommend this. If you're interested at all about the economies of certain countries or States or things like prison system, business, um, how to run an auction, the case for a zero dollar minimum wage, the richest generation history, or any other economics type stuff. Economics Explained is a good channel for that. Recommend that. But there's one that, an episode that he does specifically on uh, Pokemon cards. It's called the Pokemon card price boom. It came yes. out about a month ago. And I think it does an excellent job for um, a casual viewer about the, you know, craze that is the Pokemon trading cards and why it's suddenly big all of a sudden. Now, it kind of does a service level analysis of it. It talks a little about how it was popped up, you know, big time by a bunch of YouTubers of that sort, but it, it doesn't go into super detail about how it happened or like when it happened, like the exact things they did, but it kind of gives a nice overall story. It talks about the scarcity of the cards and how since they were rare back in the nineties, they're rare now. And then since the, many of these cards didn't survive in great condition, it pushed the ones that are in good condition to be worth quite a lot, right? That's correct. Uh, they, they covered on uh, several great points in the market of Pokemon cards that are worth consideration, uh, especially that the population of the cards that are in good quality are scarce and becoming more scarce every day. So the thing that the video does well is highlight the market and how the market is being approached by our generation up to this point. And what I think that they're kind of hinting at, or what they sort of geared towards, is discouraging people from investing too much into the Pokemon card craze. Tracking how it started earlier this year kind of had a few different ways in which there was a, a noticeable trend. And the video uh, actually does briefly mention it with the sort of unexpected depression that our generation has kind of been put into because of the uh, COVID pandemic. We found ourselves at home. We found ourselves reminiscing of a, a better time when we kind of needed to scratch our heads about how we were going to dig ourselves out of this rut. For wait, those... That's, wait, you, so, wait, sorry to interrupt. You, you bring up a good point. They were all at home, which gave us ample time to be on social media more and see folks like, what was the guy's name? Logan Paul? Yes, one of them is, yeah. He sort of entered late as things were picking up, but if you were interested in Pokemon or if you were just casually just sent home due to the lockdown, between March, April, and May, uh, if you had increased your YouTube usage, you may have noticed Pokemon YouTubers or YouTubers who do Pokemon such as Leonhart, Unlisted Leaf, Rhyme Style, Pokerand, Pokerev, some really great uh, PokeTubers who make their content based off of Pokemon, Pokemon card sales, Pokemon card investments. Uh, they pretty much hit the market on all Pokemon cards and uh, collectibles as well, not just Pokemon. If you're interested, uh, I highly encourage Pinpoint players to go check out some of those YouTubers. And if you are, let us know down below. It's always helpful to get feedback from our audience. And yeah, let us know uh, what you guys even overall think of this topic and... If some of you did end up seeing the Economics Explained video, let us know too, because I'm just curious to see who else watches, you know, these random educational channels on YouTube. It's always good to see um, this kind of content being passed around because it's just very knowledgeable stuff. It certainly is. I mean, we're all we're all part of this discussion in a way, especially if we engaged in collecting Pokemon cards. Now, like I, as I mentioned, we were all stuck at home. We're, we're scratching our heads trying to figure out how we're going to dig ourselves out of this rut and. For those of us who did collect Pokemon cards seriously, like you, who put his cards in a binder, protected them, he, we, we eventually knew that someday these cards would be worth something. But we never know when something like that occurs. We never know where we're going to be or if we're ever truly prepared. And the market speaks volumes. And what the market has told us is that in recent months some very serious players, not in the Pokemon market, but economics. Uh, unfortunately, this individual, Logan Paul, who has made a, a, you know, a word for himself doing some... Well, he's a boxer, too, so I suppose that sort of explains his behavior. 
regardless, I don't want to get too much into it. This, this, it's unfortunate this individual saw the attention and attraction that Pokemon was getting. And roughly around July and August of this year, he started to make Pokemon card related videos. And if you haven't seen them, I suggest that you take a look at them. They are actually quite informative for the source content it's coming from. Um, he kind of stole, in my opinion, the Pokemon card market, which is run mostly by independent sellers, which is very easy to manipulate. The way that he did that was uh, once he became interested in Pokemon cards, the commodity, he did his research into which cards are quote unquote valuable. It's all outlined in the first video, where he details how you can invest in his uh, first edition booster box. He says he looked up which cards were selling for the highest price, who to talk to to learn what would be the best cards to have, and which ones to buy, and buyers to buy them from. So by doing that, he's collecting the entire value of the market in a single swoop for himself. When you do that as an independent marketer, you dictate price. So if you're willing to pay thirty or forty thousand dollars, that is what the price will be set at. Funny you're saying all this for many different reasons. Just about the the Pokemon, the price of a loan, how it's you know manipulated by large part by this one guy. Do you remember an episode of Recess where I think the kid TJ he found out that the entire playground was trading a bunch of these these cards as currency and so he ended up basically finding a way to kind of get almost all the cards he controlled the value of them and then finally it collapsed and then they made a new currency and then it made his worthless overnight i'm not <laughs> saying that's going to happen here with pokemon cards but it just it kind of reminded me of that that's he vague, kind of yeah, a vaguely accrued all that value and changed the value overnight or helped to usher in a new like crazy value for it it's certainly an interesting tactic of economics it's playing out. Right now, it's playing out. And as of today, the, the market sort of has stabilized. Uh, modern, for a few months after Logan Paul did that stint, modern Pokemon cards, and I mean modern within the last five years, 2015 and up, saw a small boost in value for their cards because A, those cards were associated with Pokemon, Pokemon the Commodity. And B, the hollows for those cards were being swept up into the news media franchise's hype for what had just happened. And Pokemon cards, the commodity, saw a very small spike for a few months. Vintage Pokemon has not seen a recovery. Uh, for all those pinpoint players out there who are listening, if you have Pokemon base set, base set 2, fossil, jungle... Expedition, uh, Gym Heroes, Gym Challenge, or Legendary Collection Pokemon cards printed by the Wizards of the Coast between 1999 and 2002, your Pokemon cards might actually be worth something if you kept them in good condition. He does not exaggerate. I'm going to say this right now. I have a base set Charizard. My dad got that for me as a birthday gift, as one of my birthday gifts back in the 90s. He got it at this place in Cambridge. I think it was called Card Dog. It's probably been gone for like 15 years now. When I drove by it a few weeks ago, it was, a, I think, a pet shop for selling pet supplies. Anyway, oh, no kidding. That card, I have it with me. And I don't think it's a PSA 10, but if it were a PSA 10, not Shadowless, by the way, but if it were just a plain PSA 10, and I'll get to what PSA is in a second... But if it was a PSA 10, it could be worth, I think, about five to six grand. And that's just the base set. Now, if you throw in a first edition, you might get that up to eight or nine grand. Now, if you take the Shadowless, and that's where there's no shadow around the borders of the card, you've got a card that could potentially be worth a PSA 10 one. What would you say? What is it, Tim? Maybe thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000? Yeah. I, um, I haven't seen a recent listing sold on eBay, but the last ones that I did see... We're roughly between twelve and thirteen thousand dollars for a shadowless. Okay, so they have some stabilized a bit, but maybe during the peak of it, it was thirty to forty thousand. Oh yeah, it was to a point, folks, where you could go trade that in for a brand new Jeep Sahara, like from a dealership, if the the person really wanted that car instead of the cash. Anyway, neither here nor there about that specifically. I mentioned PSA. 
so let me just explain that. A PSA, for folks that don't know, is the rating system that's used to grade the cards from a score of 1 to 10. And the place is based in California, and it's kind of the holy grail that a lot of these trading card folks will use to get their cards graded. Because if you get them, an independent body, to say that your Pokemon card, a holographic one from the 90s, like a Raichu, Charizard, Blastoise, is a PSA 10, and it's first edition, well, you're sitting on a lot of potential money. It is worth looking into. PSA is one of them. Uh, there are several collectors' memorabilia services out there. PSA, certainly one of the most recognizable, certainly the easiest for customers to deal with. They're a decent company. I'm not going to say anything t too terrible about them, but this is something that people are becoming uh, aware of, and supply and demand. So their supply for service has actually been restricted recently. So. Oh yes, it takes months now. So I think what the turnaround time now for just a regular send-in is maybe what five months now. Yep, that's yeah. It's roughly how long it would take for a single order for a person submitting cards to be uh, graded and turned around and, and returned. So there you go, folks. If you folks have cards and you're serious about this, I would look into this now because it will take until probably summer for next year for you to get those cards back graded, and then you can list them yourselves. So it's a long turnaround. Which is actually quite healthy. Um, if you do look at different trends in other markets similar to Pokemon, there will be a dip in uh, a certain point in the year where people are either preparing to grade their cards for sale, or they ha no longer have the card for sale to sell. And therefore, sales just go down for the cards when people decide to uh, sell the cards or their orders are returned to them for sale, that's when sales start to go up for cards because people have them to sell. So it is healthy for you know, a slight dip in the market. Oh, you know, I don't see sales on eBay. I don't see, you know, prices changing for this card or that card. I'm seeing the price for this card decrease. Oh no, what am I going to do? Don't worry. There is a healthy... Eat and breathe in and a breathe out for the market. Just like with stocks, so fair enough. I would like to go back to the Economics Explained video first. There's a lot of good other nuggets that I did like from it as far as, uh, hey, here's something that's interesting that I think you all would find interesting. And so, yeah, I, I talked about the PSC risk system. He also talks about it too, which I found to be, you know, quite nice from a casual, you know, potential casual viewer of that channel you know, explains the PSA rating system, why it's important. And he explains that only early edition cards in the 90s will have value because no one thought about the idea of collecting them this way like people do now. So the fact that, Tim, you and I thought about collecting these cards back in the 90s, potentially holding them for value in the future, was forward thinking because most people either play with them or rough up or roughed up with them. I mean, let's be honest, most of these Pokemon cards are either in rough condition, which means that the ones we have are worth more because of that. And the other sheer fact is... A lot of parents, like our friend Greg pointed this out, and he made a good point. A lot of our parents saw that, oh, it's some childhood thing. Well, they're out of the house or they're grown up, so I'm just going to throw it out. And they didn't realize that they were throwing away, you know, potential, you know, wads of cash. Oh, I know. It, it's, it's, scary. it's a scary thing to, you know, think that that actually happened. But if there was anyone out there who was affected by that, the modern cards are also an option just to get back into collecting. They are something that you can use. You can, if you can trade, I don't know if anyone's actually done this, but I, let me know if uh, Rambo, you also have heard this expression. If you can trade a paper clip for a house, I think that you can trade a modern Pokemon card for a vintage one. Do you know that expression? Trading a paper clip up for a house? I do. I do know that expression, and you're absolutely right. There is somebody that will take that vintage card and trade it up to, what did you say it was? Well, I use you know, uh, mod uh, a modern Pokemon card for a, a, a vintage classic Pokemon card. Oh, yeah. I mean, it might take a lot of trades because there are a lot of worthless modern Pokemon cards that are worth, like, cents on the dollar. But yeah. you could work your way up. It'd take forever, but you could. But, yeah, one of the things that I think is going to hold or retain value in Pokemon cards for a long time is that there are people who associate their favorite Pokemon. Rambo, what's your favorite Pokemon? Mine's Pidgeot. Nice. I have a hollow Pidgeot, and I know what it could be valued on. A PSA 10 Pidgeot could be worth $1,500 on eBay, and I'm aware of this, and that was, and that could pay off my rent 
for the month, or it could pay off a few car payments, or it could put it into the stock market. But you know what? The sentimental value is too high. Maybe I'll feel differently about that in the future, like when I'm 50. Maybe it'll be worth even more. But for now, the sentimental value is too high. So that's one where I couldn't see myself selling it. The same goes for me when it comes to Raichu. I have several first edition Raichu cards that I'm going to send off to get graded someday. Someday. I recently came across an auction for a first edition Shining Raichu card from the Neo Destiny set. It was a secret rare. It was a beautiful oh, nice. card. I just could tell it was a it was a PSA ten, and I did all my due diligence. I saw what it was selling for. I saw what it was being sold for, pre graded and post graded. I made a detailed calculation about which funds I would allocate to make a high class bid, and I thought I you know did it, well, I thought I did everything right for the universe to land in my favor. But uh, c'est la vie, you know, not the way, but. Uh, to this day, you know, I'm going to hunt for that card. I don't know if I'll ever sell my Raichu cards. They are my most valuable ones, and if I'm going to make money off of my Pokemon, it would be with my Raichu cards. But it's that, it's that type of sentimental value that is creating this surge now. We had them then, and we want them now. And on that note of, you know, the value now, what it is now, um... So for all things and purpose, for all intents and purposes about these Pokemon cards, they're you know a great sentimental thing. But as far as full disclosure, I've not played the Pokemon game since like the '90s, like the card game. So according to Economics Explain, and I'll have to take his faith here. Um, he said that because of the idea of power creep, which I take to mean that a lot of old cards are quite nerfed in power compared to current ones. These current rare cards, like these Charizards, that are worth like you know potentially ten plus grand. Are not that good as far as a playing card now they're very valuable because of everything we've explained so far but it takes it makes me believe that these are definitely more of a collector's thing than more of a, a utility or a commodity and so they're valuable because they're rare not so much they're valuable because they have utilitarian it's not quite the same as like getting a designer handbag that's you know from the 70s that's still worth its value in good condition or a rolex like a rolex is a big expensive piece of you know, jewelry that could easily be done by a $5 cycle watch that you could buy on Amazon, but it still tells time and the value of them just accrue because of the nature of the Rolex, because of their legacy. That all said, my long-winded point is, at the end of the day, I think these Pokemon cards are a awesome, nostalgic, you know, collectible thing, but they don't have that same kind of utility value as modern Pokemon playset. Now again, since I don't play the game, obviously I'm biased here in that opinion, but that's what kind of what Economics Explain guy was getting at in the video. This will be up to you and I and other folks to decide. Is this an ostentatious good? Potentially. And it also is potentially a very speculative good. I mean, what are your thoughts there? Well, so my, my thoughts sort of differ in the sense that I have a little more confidence in Pokemon cards as sort of an art piece, uh, history kind of, uh, what am I trying to say? Identity. I can certainly see them as a commodity, and the way that the video and the guy in the video uh, was trying to paint Pokemon cards was certainly accurate. I'm not going to disagree with that point. The Pokemon cards that are valuable, uh, are valuable don't serve a utilitary uh, purpose in the game, and uh, they are mostly a, a sort of a rare because they're rare and they're valuable because they're being sold expensively today i noticed that there are things in this world that we cultivate or recognize collectively as the human culture uh, to be either imaginative beautiful wonderful sense this sort of sense of uh, security and it's the things that we create paintings uh, like you said the rolex it's a very reliable watch it tells time just like any other piece but pokemon has captured the imagination of a generation in a degree that i don't think has been measured but it also falls in the line of economics that do exist today in sort of similar markets although this video was comparing pokemon cards to things like a rolex <laughs> I don't think that you should compare a whale to a dolphin. I think that you should compare Pokemon cards to things like baseball cards. Baseball cards are a very sustainable uh, collector's market. 
In fact, one of the most valuable trading cards ever sold was a baseball card. The, the famous T206 Onus Wagner, Beckett Pristine, PSA, uh, Beckett Pristine 10 sold for $150 million. This, this is one of 50 cards that were produced between 1909 and 1911. This is something that has been in our history. And I think that this is our generation's Onus Wagner the first edition Charizard. And if we're not careful, we might miss the opportunity to seal this type of product away for our generation, for our, our children's generation. You know, imagine having, uh, let's see, modern set, modern set, Pokemon, Champion's Path. It has a Charizard card in it called Hyper Rare Full Art VMAX Charizard. It's this really beefed up rainbow painting card it's beautiful. Right now, it's currently selling for $500. PSA 10, it's selling for around $15 to $2,000. Not too many prints of this card. Our generation has the chance to put it in a binder, put it in a PSA grade 10, and give it to our children. And their children will give it to their children. And it may be worth roughly $1,000 today, but when my great-grandchild has that card, who knows what it could be worth? You might just have given your great grandchild the ability to buy a house, go to college, and be able to then take the rest and then live off the earnings of that for the rest of their life, depending on how this all shapes out. Potentially. We'll see. You make a very compelling point with that entire argument and you know, wholly agree with you. Like this is a chance for this is a chance for it to be our generation's, you know, Onus Wagner. I'm assuming that's his name. It may not be to this it won't be to the same rareness, I think. But that's the thing. 100 years ago, 120 years ago, no one thought that a baseball card would be worth that kind of money today. So there are those folks thinking that there's no way a shadowless Charizard will be that worth that much in 100 years. But we'll see. We I mean, will. Very compelling enough point. And that's the thing. You're absolutely right. You can't quite compare a Rolex to this because Rolexes are made for a different type of, I mean, a different type of commodity, a different kind of value. They have watches. They are useful, but they're also collectors. They also are intentionally made to be very um, limited set. So if you were to buy a Rolex from 20 years ago, it's not like they're going to do a rebranding of those. They might do like a remake, so to speak, but they're not going to make the exact same one. So it's a little different. So I do agree with that. Yeah, uh, Rolex is easily one of the most identifiable watch companies. The same as when you think uh, trading card companies. You either think Pokemon, Magic, or Yu-Gi-Oh! And funny enough, those are the three top fantasy trading card uh, products that Beckett, PSA, and a newer contender, CDC, are starting to grade, is those three competing, rivaling companies. The video did say Pokemon has no one to compete against. If you want a Pokemon card, you buy Pokemon, which is true. There is no other company that prints Pokemon. But in the fantasy realm of trading card, Pokemon collectors don't just collect Pokemon. They collect magic, they collect Yu-Gi-Oh, they collect baseball, football, uh, basketball cards. Basketball cards, dude. If you go to our local Target, you have to arrive there at a certain specific time, right before all the basketball card junkies get there, swoop up all the products. Because you know what they do is they buy those boxes for $20 a piece and sell them online for hundreds of dollars a piece because of a potential chance to pull, I think it's called a prismatic rookie card of uh the player of the year not too sure didn't look too hard into this but something along those lines gotcha so yeah no it's you're right i mean basketball has to compete with like other sports and stuff like that so so the value of these cards will definitely be high but they'll never be high as pokemon Yu Gi or magic because they're only competing with themselves so to that end you're right these kind of things We'll just probably keep going up in values. So with the luxury of time, the cards that we hold now, the ones that we get graded now, will be worth quite a lot more in the future. Potentially. And you know yeah. what? Thinking on this, the, po the idea of Pokemon being so big, how it struck us in the 90s as kids, how it became a huge worldwide phenomenon. Thinking back on it, watching the Saturday morning cartoons back in the 90s, playing the Game Boy games, playing the really popular, you know, blue, red, yellow. Some could argue that something like this was inevitable. I mean... I know, power of hindsight 2020, but given the effect that it had on our lives back in the 90s, given like what it meant to us collecting these things, I guess it was inevitable something like this would happen. If we waited for this when we were kids, 
you know, get the cards now and kind of sit and wait on them. And now this is the results, the fruit of our labor, and we've got the cards. Now all we have to do is do the work, get them graded, and then you and I can just sell them now for thousands, or maybe in the future sell them for tens of thousands. Depends. It's all up to us. And it's not just you and me. It's any one of the pinpoint players who also has Pokemon cards, has been hearing the hype in the news, and has been sitting on them for just as long as we have. I encourage anyone listening, uh, take a look. If you've had Pokemon cards, take a look at what you've had. The internet will definitely tell you what you're looking for. Uh, They will be able to tell you what kind of cards you have. You just need to know what questions to ask. You know, to that end, Pokemon has been a huge phenomenon for the last 20, quarter of a century, 25 years starting next year. There are going to be some really special cards that Pokemon Card Company distributes over the next year that in 25 years will be 25 years old for Pokemon's 50th anniversary. And these cards will not be printed ever again. So this is a chance for us to look forward to the gifts of the new year. Well, dude, it looks like you and I have, it's been a little while. I thought I would never buy another Pokemon card again or another booster pack, but I might just have to break that promise. It's been 20 years or so now, but looks like it's time to get back into it yeah and it's not going to take too much even if you were to buy two or three booster packs you know one booster pack for you one booster pack for your significant other one booster pack for your child when they're 25 30 years old those are going to be booster packs and pokemon cards that no one has seen in over uh, 50 60 years they're going to be what our generation is going through with pokemon cards it's a really interesting thing to be a part of today it really is Glad we could have all been a part of it. It's been an interesting lifetime with this so far. Like, nobody would have thought the people that collect all these sport trading cards back in the 90s were, probably thought this stuff was stupid. Well, in the end, with the exception of a couple um, basketball, baseball, or whatever trading cards, they never would have thought something like a Shadowless Charizard would be worth more than those cards. Oh, I know. It's quite fascinating. It's an interesting trend. It's, it's, it's where our generation is taking the mystery, the mysterious hand of the economy. It was difficult to measure, but being at the right place at the right time, I kind of I kind of saw this trend happen. I was just buying Pokemon cards just to get my personal collection better. And as I was doing that, I witnessed price just go up and up and up. And it was more difficult to get the cards that I was looking for. You and I definitely um, saw this back in the 90s. This is us sitting on it, and here we are. Yeah, here we are, dude. I mean, it's been an interesting lifetime, and... It's been an interesting year, to say the least. It definitely has, and we can all hope that the next one will be a little bit better than this one. You know, I feel like it will be because I can guarantee the Pinpoint players we have some great content for them lined up next year. Coming up will be an episode on sequels and remakes, published on December 30th. A discussion that we have between the gaming industry's push for more sequels and interesting remakes. We'll also follow that up January 13th, with our discussion on gaming culture throughout the ages. We have some wonderful personal anecdotes, and that'll also be our Season 1 finale. And on January 27th, we'll premiere with Season 2 with the Netflix series High Scores, which goes over important gaming culture events from the 70s to the early 90s. And we hope you'll be for that because we review the whole six episodes. It'll be really, really cool. So I hope that you guys join us. Hope that you guys enjoyed the content that we've put out so far. Hope you guys are looking forward to the incoming episodes and content that we have into the new year. And most importantly, I hope that you enjoy the new year. And one last thing, if you like our content, give us a five stars on Apple Podcasts if you really like it. Give us a like and subscribe on YouTube. But yeah, just like Tim says, we hope you enjoy the new year and we'll see you next time. Take care, Pinpoint Players.